Welcome to Harvest Mission Community Church. You are listening to one of our sermons. I'm going to go ahead and jump into the Word. If you have your Bibles, turn to Acts chapter 2. This is a very famous passage about community and why the church is so significant and important for us. We're also going to ask you to turn to Acts chapter 4 because we'll look at that passage as well. So I'm going to start off and ask a question, and hopefully you could be brave enough to raise your hand and, you know, don't be shy, but can I ask how many of you are genuine introverts and you really like being alone? Can I go ahead and see, go, see, see, they're already shy. They're a little bit introverted. They don't want to raise their hand. Go ahead, just raise your hand really high, okay? All right? Okay, thank you. You can put your hands down. Now, how many of you guys are, didn't raise your hand because you're closet uh, introverts? You, you're, you just learned how to be more extroverted. You know, I don't think there's anything wrong with being an introvert, nor an extrovert, if you look at it from that angle. And the reason why I think it's good to be an introvert uh, in, in certain situations is because the me time, alone time, is very important. It allows us to re-energize. It allows us to uh, just have some space in this busy hustle-bustle city of Hong Kong and this crazy city where you're just moving from place to place, going from one meeting to another. It is good to have some me time. So those of us who are a little bit more introverted, I think it's a good thing, but I think the key thing that I want to share is this. It's not so much about your personality of being introverted or extroverted, but the question is, are you connected? Do you have people that you are connected with? Some of you are like, I don't need anybody. I'm an introvert, so I can just read a book or just watch TV, and I'm, I'm fine with that. But one of the things that you need to understand is that a lot of research is being done. And what they're finding out, these researchers, is that especially with COVID and the isolation that so many people have experienced in their lives, loneliness is becoming an epidemic. In fact, it's not just loneliness alone, but as they did further research, and it's a little bit of a longitudinal research, what they found out is that loneliness, if it continues on in your life, you're isolated by yourself, not only does it affect you emotionally, mentally, But what they're saying is that it is as equal or similar to smoking and excessive drinking, where it causes health problems. So I want you to think about that for a moment. That loneliness, being by yourself, not being connected. I'm not talking about introverts and just they need their alone time. But we're talking about connectedness with people that it could actually be dangerous for your health. And as I was thinking about this whole two, three years, it really heightened the sense of loneliness and isolation. I know many of you are here because throughout this whole week, uh, we've been kind of doing a lot of different activities for those of you who are new to Hong Kong. And so you saw all these like lilac, I think that's the official color, or lavender color shirts. And, you know, you, you started get talking with some of those guys and You decided to come out to church and check it out. And I did that this whole week. I was hanging out with BU and CDU people. And let me, okay, we have one person who's excited that they go to (laughs) BU and CDU. (laughs) But but I will have to say I was a little bit depressed. A little bit sad. And let me explain. Because as I was hanging out with these guys, I just turned over to one person and I just said, can I ask, when were you born? And they looked over to me in the 2003, and I'm like, <laughs> you know, as you get older, your memory gets worse, but I remember 2003. And this one person was like, 2004. I'm like, oh, great. <laughs> and I like to play this game, and usually when I'm wearing a hat, I'm like, guess how old I am? And some of them are so nice, so they're just like, oh, you're a little bit older, you know, but didn't want to say the age. So funny. <laughs> But it was interesting because I actually got an opportunity to meet a lot of second-year students who are on the campus for the very first time. We collectively decided that is how you should introduce yourself. I'm a second-year student, but on the campus for the very first time. And I found out that some of these students were online the whole year, their freshman year. So now they're second years in university, and this is their first time 
on that campus. That's why they look like a freshman. You know, they don't know where classes are. I, th- I found it really interesting, and I said, how was it? And, you know, some people enjoyed it. Some people were like, yeah, it's great. You just wake up and then go to class and then go back to sleep, you know, different things like that. But I was thinking, what did some of us, even those of you who are working, working from home, what are some of the things that you experience just being isolated and not interacting? But here you are, IRL, in real life, and we're trying to do community. I want to show you this quick video. It's um, the TV news magazine, 60 Minutes. I don't know if you've ever heard of 60 Minutes. And this is the one in Australia. And what they did was they were actually doing uh, investigative journaling on the whole issue of loneliness and how that it is a pandemic or uh, uh, I just slipped, it just slipped my mind. That it was, I just call it issue. It was an issue uh, in society and how it's, affecting so many people. So I want to go ahead and just show you this video. Let's just kind of listen to it. And then afterwards, I'll come back and kind of go into the passage. So let's watch this together. <laughs> They're starting to teach them how to grill at a young age. You know, that's, that's what it is. But can you imagine you actually pay a service for people to pretend to be your spouse and your child? That's what's happening in Japan. And I believe that's what's going to happen all over Asia. Not only because of the family breakdown, but because we're living in a society, even though it's so compact, and even here in Hong Kong, about 7.4 million people. There are many of us, many people in Hong Kong who are alone. I'm just wondering, here you are, sitting in the midst of all these people, and you can identify because you feel that loneliness coming all over you. There's something about community that really transforms a person's life. When you're doing life together with other people. And that experience will really help you to see that we were not meant to be alone. In fact, God created you, he created me so that we could be in relationship with one another. I, when I think about community in this world, there's so many different communities. Uh, there's a cooking community. Uh, th- there's a, a drinking community. I mean, we're talking about there's bouldering community. There's so many different types. Hiking community. I went hiking. I'm really sore. So there's hiking community, which I'm not going to join. But anyway, there's a hiking community. There are so many different communities. But here's the question. What makes a biblical community, a Christian community, different from all the other communities in the world? And to answer that question, I think John uh, R. W. Stott in his book, The Cross of Christ, gives us a glimpse of why the biblical community is so different. He says this, The Christian community is a community of the cross, for it has been brought into being by the cross, and the focus of its worship is the Lamb once slain, now glorified. So the community of the cross is a community of celebration, a Eucharistic community ceaselessly offering to God through Christ the sacrifice of our praise and thanksgiving. The Christian life is an unending festival, and the festival we keep is a joyous celebration of His sacrifice together with the spiritual feasting upon it. The reason why a biblical community is so different from all the other communities is because it is not based on an activity. Because if you don't have that activity that brings you together, a lot of times you won't have that community. But what Dr. Stott was saying was simply this, is the the reason why a biblical community is a biblical community is because the cross of Jesus Christ and what he has done for us. That's why it changes everything. The way we love one another, the way we serve one another, the way we help one another, the way we encourage one another, all these things that we see in Scripture about the one another is because of Jesus Christ. That's why you could be in a community with people who are different from you ethnically, racially. You could be in a community with people who are different socioeconomically, whether you're rich or poor or whatever background you're from. And the reason why we come together and we can come together is because of Jesus Christ. Think about some of the communities that you're part of right now. A lot of times it's because there are people who are very similar to you. 
That's why there are a lot of people who are on exchange and they come here and now they, for the very first time, they feel like a minority. Well, welcome to the world. There's a lot of people all over the world that feels like a minority. It is going to open up your eyes and broaden your perspective in life. And that's good for you. That's good for us. For some of us, we are so comfortable with the type of people because we just enjoy this one thing. But what it does is it makes you implode because all you are concerned about is yourselves. This is the reason why I believe a biblical community is so needed in this generation as we're talking about loneliness. And if we're serious about experiencing life in real life right now, face to face, then we have to understand the importance of community. And I believe it's this kind of community, the radical community, that will transform the world. So here's the one thing that I want you to remember, and simply this. A biblical community can transform a society. So when we understand what a biblical community is, you realize that the power it has to impact and transform a society. So what I'm going to do is today, I'm going to look into the early church, just looking straight from the scriptures, look at the early church and how they practice community, which literally transformed their society during that time. And we want to draw some principles from it and apply it into our lives, especially in the 21st century. How can we live with these biblical principles in our lives so that we can be the church that God wants us to be? Let me just say, for those of us who are new to our church, uh, in our church we have these five pithy statements that we normally say. And I'm going to share them with you today. But in these phrases, it will give you a glimpse of what it is that makes up a community, a biblical community that's different from all other communities. So today, I'm going to just quickly share five things for you so that you understand why a biblical community can transform a society. The first thing is this, is that a biblical community helps to testify to God's greatness. That's one of the first things that you have to understand about a community that's in Christ is that it helps to testify to the greatness of who God is. Let's go ahead and read Acts chapter 2, verse 42 to 47. And if you don't have your Bibles, it's right up here, so you can just kind of follow along. This is what the Word of God says. And they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the fellowship, to the breaking of bread and, pr and the prayers. And all came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were being done through the apostles. And all who believed were together and had all things in common. And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as all had need. And day by day, attending the temple together and breaking bread in their homes, they received their food with glad and generous hearts, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to their number day by day those who are being saved. Now, you have to keep in mind that this passage gives us a glimpse of what the early church was like. Now, before we kind of dive into this, you have to understand that by this time, Jesus died on the cross. He rose again from the dead. He appeared to the disciples. And then in Acts chapter 1, he says, wait for the Holy Spirit to come upon you. And then he says, you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of this earth. Now, I want to show you just really briefly that just the picture that God had of what the church, the early church, were supposed to do. So if you look at it, you will notice here, um, let's, let's look at the picture of, of Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria. Do we have that picture? Okay, we'll, we'll get this. So here it says Jerusalem. So you're going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem. And then it says in Judea. So it, it should encompass a little bit more. Samaria. And then to the ends of this earth. So what Jesus had in mind is that this small little community of believers that were gathering together, starting from Jerusalem, that it was going to ripple out to pretty much the known world at that time. So in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of this earth. So when you think about all this, this is when you come to the realization where now this community is being introduced. The Holy Spirit came. They started speaking in tongues. Uh, the, the whole place that they were worshiping and praying started shaking. And then we see here that's when the church, the community, got started. Uh, 
Look at verse 41, and which we didn't read, but I'm going to look at verse 41 and listen to what it says here. It says, so those who received his word were baptized and they were added that day about 3,000 souls. We're talking about there was a massive move of God and a revival. 3,000 souls were added at that time. And then if you go back now to verse 42, you'll notice the word devoted. They devoted themselves, and there's a list of things that they devoted themselves to. The word devoted means to continue steadfastly or to constantly be diligent. And it has this idea of persevering in or adhering to. And that's where, that's where you get the translation in the message translate, committed. So they were committed or adhering to, or they were diligently following, and they were faithful to, they continued to steadfastly devote themselves to the apostles' teaching and to the breaking of bread and to the fellowship and all these different traits of the early church. Now, the powerful thing you have to understand is that they devoted themselves to these things. Why? Because they encountered God in that powerful way. You will notice here that in verse 43, that their lives were so devoted to God that they started seeing things happen in their midst. And that's why it says in verse 43, the word all. You see that and it's translated as fear. Now, it's not the scary kind of fear, but it's a sense of reverence. They realized that God was in that, their midst and in that place. I'm just wondering here. So that's why if you look at this... Uh, Contemporary English version, it says, everyone was amazed. I'm just wondering, have you ever experienced a community like this? Where it's not about a person, but you actually experience God in the midst. And you realize that God is here in this place. You see the greatness of God. This is the kind of community that we want to experience in our church. Where we are testifying to the greatness of God and who God is. Yesterday I had the opportunity just to meet a lot of different people and it was great and uh, there was this one person we were on this hike and we were just talking together and I think we might have probably talked about an hour or so because we're trying to calculate how, how we're going to get down, how long is it going to take. So we were walking together and we were just talking together and as we were talking we were sharing about so many different things and I, I just had an opportunity to share my testimony. Just all the different things that God did in my life and uh, you know I don't know if this person was blessed as they were hearing it, but all I can say was, as I was sharing it, something happened inside of me. As I was testifying to the greatness of God, it helped me to remember the faithfulness of God. It helped me to remember, oh yeah, God did all those things in my life. And as I was finishing sharing my testimony, and then when I went back home, I don't know, I had this tremendous feeling in my heart, like, like I just shared my life, my story about what God did because we didn't grow up in, our, my family didn't grow up in a Christian home, just sharing how God reached out to us. We weren't looking for him, but he, he found us. And as I was sharing these things, I, when I went home, I was just so thankful, tired, but sore, but I was thankful that this is how great and good God is. I'm just wondering that if you're part of a community, do you testify to the greatness of God? Now, I'm not against chit-chatting and all the small talk, but somewhere within this community, as you listen to each other's story, it, sh it should inspire you. Because of something that God is doing in your midst, that it's not something you generate, you create, but it's God working in you and working in that person. When was the last time you testified to the greatness of God? Of all the things that He has done? The times that He has saved you. The times that He watched over you. The times that He provided for you. That's what this early church did because they witnessed and experienced the resurrection of Jesus Christ. And so here they are testifying to the greatness of God, how great God is to people around them. That's why the statement that we use is inspire people, inspire people. When you are inspired by the greatness of God, then what you will do as you live your life in community is you will inspire other people. Here's the second thing. Not only does biblical community help to testify to God's greatness, but you'll notice, number two, that biblical community helps to transform us to Christ-likeness. 
that biblical community transforms us, helps to transform us to Christ's likeness. Now, as followers of Jesus Christ, one of our goals, if, if you are consider yourself a Christian, one of our goals is to become more like Jesus Christ, God's Son. And the way we do this is that we become more like Him by understanding His Word, and then we obey. And as we obey, we see all of God's promises coming true in our lives. And that's what transforms our lives. That's how we become more like Jesus Christ. Let me give you an example. When God says we should love one another, so here's the understanding of God's Word, and you obey it, and you love one another. Guess what? Even those people that you do not like, when you start loving that person, you become more like Jesus Christ. Why? Because when you look at the life of Jesus, He loved people that all things being equal, he had no business loving. They were sinful, they, they were hostile towards him, they were violent towards him. They did all these things, but he still loved them. If you remember when he was dying on the cross, he says, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they're doing. So what happens is that when you're able to understand God's word, you study it, you understand it, you obey it then, then what happens is that your life becomes more like Jesus Christ. That's why in verse 42, as we read before, we see that the early believers that devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching. They didn't have the Bible then, but they had the apostles' teachings because they spent time with Jesus. And in that community, they were listening and understanding. This is the words of Christ. Now, having a community that studies God's word together so that they can then challenge one another to obey God's word, what's going to happen is that community is going to become more like Jesus Christ. As the early church grew and spread to different places, people continued to devote themselves to the teachings of Christ. One particular community, if some of you know your scriptures, you'll notice is in Acts chapter 17, the Bereans. I'm going to read a couple verses here. Listen to what it says. It says this, The brothers immediately sent Paul and Silas away by night to Berea. And when they arrived, they went into the Jewish synagogue. Now these Jews were more noble than those in Thessalonica. They received the word with all eagerness, examining the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Many of them therefore believed, and not a few Greek women of high standing as well as men. But when the Jews from Thessalonica heard that the word of God was proclaimed by Paul at Berea also, they came there too, agitating and stirring up the souls. So you see these early believers who lived in Berea, what do they do? They examined the scriptures to see everything that Paul is saying, if it was true. And I thought it was interesting because when you study the Bereans, you see in verse 11 that, that says that they were more noble compared to all the other people. That word noble, more noble means open-minded and they were receptive and they received God's word with eagerness. When was the last time you were very open to the Word of God? And I will say this, many of you who had bad experiences at church, a lot of times it's easy to have biases about certain things in the Bible. It's so easy to kind of like overlook some of the things that the Word of God clearly says because it doesn't fit into our narrative. It doesn't fit into the cultural narrative. But this is the Word of God. And we're going to try to obey it as best as we can by His grace. But these Bereans, they study the word. And that's why it says, examine the scriptures daily to see if these things were so. Let me give you a couple other translations to help you to understand what they did. In the contemporary English version, it says this. It says, day after day, and then read the yellow section with me. It says what? They study the scriptures to see if these things were true. So they were studying it. And that's what a biblical community does. You study the word together so you understand God's word together and share what God is speaking to you about. Here's another translation, the NLT, the New Living Translation is this. They what? Come on, say this. Search the scriptures day after day to see if Paul and Silas were teaching the truth. So this idea of examining, studying, and searching the scriptures to understand the truth of it. We live in a culture where... Uh, Okay, I, I, I'm not going to, I'm not going to, this is not a criticism, but let me just make an observation. We live in a very social, media-heavy, driven culture. When I was hanging out with some of these students, they're like, do you have Instagram? Do you have IG? And I'm like, I do, but I'm a Twitter guy, you know, and I haven't 
IG'd in like years, like eight years or something like that. And I said, I have two. One is the one that's me personally, but I have another one where I like to put different quotes that I, you know, I come up with. And so, you know, you can follow that. Not too many followed it. Anyway, so I'm like, okay, that's okay. But we get our news where? From social media. If that's you, just, just look at me straight. You know, don't turn, look down, then you're going to be guilty. Just go ahead and just smile and look at me. Like, if, you, if the only news you get about the world is through social media, you're in trouble. Because it's more like a political or opinionated kind of news feed. And that's why every single time I open up my browser, I have about 30-some tabs open because at least 80-some percent of it or outside of the emails and all that, it is all news. I get some of my news from the left, I get some from the right, I get some from more of the centric, and then I have to discern which is telling, because everyone is giving their opinion. And I think this is the problem with so many of us. If you're getting the news, you're not looking at it through scripture. You're looking at according to how you feel, or what this political person is saying, or this social influencer is saying. And some of their values and some of the things that they believe in might not be in line with what Scripture says. That's why I pray that in this biblical community that we will examine and study and search the Scriptures to say, God, what is it that you're saying? And some of you might have heard, but there's a lot of cults on the universities. And they will teach different things. So that's why we need to have an open mind to be able to search the Scriptures. Is this what the Bible teaches? Or is this something that is now twisted for their own means? These are things that I hope that you're being challenged by, and I pray that in a biblical community that you will be able to study the Word. This is the thing. The reason why it's important as we look at this early church, and not only did they testify to the greatness of God, but their lives were being transformed into Christ's likeness because they were in discipleship relationships. They were sharpening one another. They were helping each other. They were spurring one another on. That's what the book of Hebrews says. Look at what it says in Hebrews. And read the yellow section with me uh, as well. It says this. Let us think of ways to what? Motivate one another to acts of love and good works. And let us not neglect our meeting together as some people do, but encourage one another, especially now that the day of his return is drawing near. When you come together in a biblical community and in those discipleship relations and you're studying the word, what begins to happen is you motivate one another or spur one another on. And it helps you to encourage one another with God's truth. So that's why we have a, another statement that we say is disciple people, disciple people. And I believe in this because I've seen people who have been discipled and usually they're the ones whose lives are changed and they want to disciple other people. You could always tell a person who hasn't really been discipled or they're not being discipled right now. They're just kind of wandering around and they, they don't have any directions. Now, I'm not saying that the disciple tells you what to do, but under the guidance of the Holy Scriptures, that with their experience in life, you learn together and you learn from that person. So disciple people, disciple people. Here's the third thing. We're going to try to move along here. The community helps to teach us to love, as I shared earlier. When you're part of a biblical community, it helps you and teaches us to love. As many of you know, one of the distinguishing marks of a Christ follower, of a Christian, is love. Now, let me just say very bluntly, I do not think we have done a good job in this area. If you were to ask any pre-Christian or anyone from the outside society and they say, do you think that Christians are very loving? In fact, they will say, no, they're very judgmental. They're very hypocritical. They will say all these things about Christians. When was the last time you actually heard when the name Christian comes up, they say, oh, how they love one another. Oh, how they love people. Oh, how they do so much good for society. When was the last time you heard that? When you look at the early church, going back to verse 42, we see the word fellowship. In the original language, it means kononia. And that word is very important, as we've been talking about throughout, just within our church. It's this idea of being together or having things in common 
or participation or partnership. Now, this is more than just hanging out. <laughs> We're together. We love, playing, we love playing video games or board games, so we're together. That's not what it's talking about. It's literally participating in each other's lives. So they went through all the joys and all the pains of life together. Can I just pause here and ask you? And some of you probably haven't experienced it yet, but I want you to think about it. If you were to receive news from back home about one of your family members, do you have somebody that will be able to listen to you and pray for you and care for you? I think that's a really telling sign if you're part of a community that genuinely loves you and you are able to love them. Let's make it more practical. Let's say you have COVID. And I'm just looking at all those people online. <laughs> Thank you for not coming and giving us COVID, you know, praise God. But let's say you got COVID. Do you have people who love you enough that will check up on you and see if you're doing okay? You know, when I traveled to the States uh, this, earlier this year, or I guess it was back in May, uh, I came back and that was when it was seven day quarantine. My wife did 21 days, like a couple of years back, because uh, to drop off my daughter to university. I don't know how she did 20 days. Uh, that is insane, but she's a little bit more introverted. So anyway, so praise God for that. But like after the fourth day, I thought I was going crazy. And instead of four walls, I thought I, was, I saw like 20 walls all around me. I was like trapped in. But I, I, I was still meeting people over Zoom. I was still leading. Uh, we had the summit for the leaders and stuff like that. But one thing that I will say is this. I was so blessed when there were different people who dropped off different things. Pastor, are you doing okay? Are there things that you need? And I realized I'm so blessed that I have a community, people who care enough just to check up and to even bless me. And I was thinking about that. I go, do we have people like that in our lives? You get sick. Something happens to your family. You're struggling. A tragedy happens. Who do you have that love you and that you're able to love? and to experience this type of community. Part of being a, in a genuine community is going through life together. Not just on Sundays, but it's, it's life where you can just say, hey, how are things going today? Where you can ask each other, encourage one another. That's why I love the contemporary English version of this verse. Listen to what it says. It says here, they spent their time learning from the apostles, and let's read this together. They were like family to each other. They also broke bread and prayed together. I love that. They were like family to each other. Some of you who are students, think about this. You're away from home. Part of life group is being able to have a family away from family, to experience this kind of life together. One thing that we always say in our church is this, who will remember your birthday? Some of you are like, oh, I was in a life group and they forgot my birthday, you know? <laughs> But think about it. Who, who are the people in your life that remembers your birthday? It's your family. To be a part of a group, a biblical community that is like a family. That's what transforms your life as you love one another. That's why I love what Dietrich Bonhoeffer said in his book, Life Together. He says, whether it is a brief, single encounter or the daily community of many years, Christian community is solely this. We belong to one another only through and in Jesus Christ. It's because of Jesus we're able to love one another. So think about community. And all the things that you're discipled in, like when you don't love that person or that type of person where you're kind of together and you have to learn how to love them. And I, that's why I believe biblical community will help us to love. So here's the statement. Love people. Love people. If you've been loved, you're going to want to love others around you. Here's the fourth one. Community help us, uh, helps us not only to testify to God's greatness, transforms us into Christ's likeness, and teaches us to love, but the fourth thing is that community helps to train us to serve. Let's read verse 45 again. This is what it says in verse 45. It says, And they were selling their possessions and belongings and distributing the proceeds to all as any had need. Now, you will notice here 
that because they experienced God's love, that they were being sacrificial to one another. Can you imagine if you were part of a community that shared with one another in this way to those people who are in need? You see another account of their generosity and their heart of service to God. Acts chapter 4, verse 32 to 35. This is the passage that I gave earlier. But it says this, Now the full number of those who believed were of one heart and one soul, and no one said that any of the things that belonged to him was his own. But they had everything in common. And with great power the apostles were giving their testimonies of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus, and great grace was upon them all. There was not a needy person among them, as many as were owners of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of what was sold and laid it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to each as any had need. I mean, just trying to imagine if this could ever happen in our generation. Well, student loan forgiveness in the United States. Forgiven, forgiven, you know, freely given. But I want you to think about this for a moment. When you read this, like, I know what that is. That's communism. I mean, if you want to think about it. Oh, that's socialism. Take money from the wealthy, give it to, you know. But can I just be clear? The Bible is not teaching socialism or communism. <laughs> Communism. That's not what it's teaching. One of the things you have to understand about this early church is that it was through the overflow of the heart. It wasn't demanded from you. It wasn't something you had to do, like paying taxes. It was a voluntary and a willful decision that a person and a group of people made because they loved God, they saw the generosity of God in their lives, and so they wanted to bless other people. This is the reason why when you see people who have experienced the gospel message, their life is being turned upside down. One of the clear signs that you will see is that they are very generous people. Now, it's not always about money. They're generous with their time. They're generous with using their gifts to bless other people. Even though it's tiring. Some of you served this whole week reaching out to people. It's tiring. But what should motivate us, it's not because we're doing this thing because we're so noble and we want to be recognized by our leaders and all these people. No, we do this because we ourselves knew what it felt like to be a freshman. We ourselves understand that when we were first coming into Hong Kong, that it wasn't easy in that transition. So because we found this community, because God has been gracious to us, now we want to in the same way allow other people to experience what we experience. That's why like serving and doing all these stuff, a lot of it is a reflection of how you understand God's grace in your life. If you see God as being stingy, then you're not going to want to give. If you see God as being generous, then your heart will overflow and you want to give to others. And that's what we see in the early church. The, the sense of generosity that overflowed into their hearts, from their hearts to others. We have to keep in mind that, once again, it is not communism. It's not socialism. This was a willing, voluntary thing that they did because of what they experienced. Tim Keller, who's a pastor in New York, he, he said this. I thought it was interesting. The early church was strikingly different from the culture around it in this way. The pagan society was stingy with its money and promiscuous with its body. A pagan gave nobody their money and practically gave everyone their body. And the Christian came along and gave practically nobody their body, and they gave practically everyone their money. <laughs> Did you get that? That's so true, isn't it? It's so countercultural. Because in this society, it's like, give your body away, give, give yourself to sex and all this other stuff, pleasure. But because they knew that their body is a temple of God, and they wanted to be able to put that in the context of what Scripture says in the context of marriage. Even generosity, I mean, look at the world. I mean, of course, there's some generous people, philanthropists, but it's driven by their own self-love to be recognized. But when you think about culture, it's pretty much stingy. But here comes these Christians in this community, and they give of themselves, and it blows everyone away. Here's the last thing, and we're going to close with this, is that the Christian community, the biblical community, helps not only in testifying to God's greatness, transforming us to Christ's likeness, teaching us to love, 
and training us to serve, but Christ, biblical community helps to tackle the Great Commission. Did I, did, did I give you the statement? I don't think I did it. it just, I just, something just popped in my mind. The statement that we talked about for the last point of training to serve is that serve people, serve people. If you've ever been served, your heart is so thankful that you want to be able to serve. Think about it this way. Have you ever been to over someone's house and they were such a great host? I mean, they were like literally on, on their feet trying to serve you making sure you're feeling comfortable, making sure you have everything. I mean, w when you are a recipient of that, it just blesses you. You're so happy, you're like, wow. That next time when you start hosting, because you receive that, you want to do the same. So those who have been served, they will serve. And I do pray that many of you, and I know some of us are in different seasons of life, some of us are struggling with different things, but I pray that if you've ever been blessed because someone served you, that you would take up that call, and we're going to have experience in membership, that you will be able to then serve others. Let me close with this last one, is the, tackling the Great Commission. The Great Commission, for many of you who might not know, or those of you who do know, it's simply from Matthew chapter 28, verse 19 and 20. This is what it says. It says, Go therefore and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I have commanded you, and behold, I am with you always to the end of age. So here's the great commission that says to go and make disciples. Making disciples is the key of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, and to teach them to obey everything that I've commanded you. Now, when you look at the great commission, you will notice in verse 47 of Acts chapter 2 again, you will notice the phrase, having favor with all the people. This idea of having favor is the same as goodwill. Now, some of you are like, still like, what does that mean? It just means there was grace. They had goodwill with people around them. It's simply people have favorable attitude towards you. So can I ask you, those of us who are working, what do your coworkers say about you? Huh. They always come late. They, they take five-hour lunch breaks. You know, I don't know. A couple hours. They're just never at work. At 6 o'clock, they're all packed, ready to go. 58, 59, bye. Bye. What do people who work at your company, what do they say about you? How about your neighborhoods or your dorm rooms, your classrooms? And I think this is important because it, that word, having favor, is synonymous with being pleased. When they saw people, the, the Christians, they're like, wow, <laughs> they're great people. Literally, they were happy to be around believers. <laughs> Do people say that about you? Uh-oh, here, here he comes, the judgmental one. Hide it, put, put everything away. Hey, what's going on, dude? You know? Like, what do they say about you? Are you winsome? And so when our life is radically transformed by the gospel, that's when it says here, the Lord added to their number daily. So, they were fulfilling this evangelism. They were sharing the gospel through their life. And that's what a biblical community does. When you are able to love one another, serve one another, you become more like Jesus Christ as you're getting discipled together. You testify to the greatness of God. And then people who are not part of this experience of this biblical community will start wondering, what is it about you guys? What is it that you have experienced that I don't know about? Why don't you tell me? What, what causes you to do what you do? And that's when you can once again share and testify to who Jesus Christ is. I just do pray that all of us will be able to remember this great commission that the early church took seriously that we will take upon ourselves. That's why the one thing is simply this. The one thing, as we talked about, is that a biblical community can transform a society. I'm going to give some quick next steps as you listen to this message. The question is, okay, pastor, now what do I do with this? Let me share a couple things. There's two things that I want you to keep in mind. The first thing is this, participate in life group. To really say to yourself, you know what? If some of you who are new, you've never been a part of a life group, once again, 
sign up and give it a try and see if this is the community that you want to invest the next four years if you're a first year student or I guess three years if you're first year on campus but second year or some of you who just moved into Hong Kong because this is what the Bible teaches and we want to live this out as best as we can. And as many of you probably heard, a life group, what, what is that all about? Well, pretty much it's a gathering of people of what I just described as biblical community. We capitalize life because it has each letter represents something that we want to experience. L is for love. I is for investment, that we're going to invest our time, energy, and life together. And then F is faith, that we're going to have faith for one another. We're going to pray. We're going to believe that God is going to do something powerful in your, your life. And then the E is enjoyment, that we're going to enjoy life together because it's about fellowship. It's about kononia. We're, we're, we have everything in common. We're sharing life together. We go through life together. That's why we call it life group. And those of us who have been part of a life group, can I just say this? If you had a great experience and you've enjoyed it, I don't have to convince you. You're, I'm preaching to the choir, but I want to speak to those of you who've been part of a life group and you either got jaded or you got lazy or you're just consuming. I don't know what it is, but that's where you are right now. And I want to challenge you that many times it's not about you. Oh, I don't get anything out of it. Oh, I don't like that leader. Oh, the, the group of people. Like, you're making everything about you. That's why you're not growing. Maybe some of you who have been in our church, and I'm speaking to those of us who are in the city ministry, you, some of you have been, as a freshman, you've been part of our life group. Four years you've been part of our life group. Now you're in our city ministry for a year, two years, however long you've been. Somewhere in your brain, in this process of yours, you have to say, I've been part of this for this many years. Well, there are people who haven't really experienced much and they're new. With everything that I've received from God, how can I just sit here and still consume rather than stepping up and serving? Now, you don't need a title. You don't need a position as a leader. But is there something in your heart and you understand the gospel that motivates you to say, you know what? I, God has been good. I have received so much from Him. So I want to be able to now give to people who are coming into this stage of life or into this experience. So I'm praying for those of us who have experienced life group and wherever your heart may be, that the Holy Spirit will convict you, you will repent, and that you will desire to remember and then to move forward and recommit to this whole life group. To those of us who are new, never experienced it, as we've been encouraging you to not only give it a try, but I'm going to tell you this. Some of your best friends will be formed in this biblical community, in Life Group. I have seen exchange students who came for only one semester, but they experienced life. They've experienced the gospel. They experienced this biblical community that some of them still keep in touch with me. Sometimes they send messages to me here and there from just all over because what they experienced here was so powerful for them, even though it was one semester, because they were all in. They said, I have one semester here in Hong Kong at this university, and I'm just going to do the best that I can, and I'm going to go. And they went to every single life group, every single activity. They were all in, and it changed their life. That's why when they went back to their country or back to that school they're finishing off, they were influencing other people with the type of community they experienced here. So I want to challenge you, even if you're one semester in, uh, exchange student, be all in. Those of you who are first-year students or new families, new working people, not only give it a try, but commit to it and see what God can do in your life. And the reason why this life group is so important to us is because our church got started back in 2005, so we're only about seven years old. We're going to be celebrating that soon, in September. We're not old. If you think about it, we're just a young church. We're trying to be faithful to what the scripture tells us. And our church was started with life groups, with a small community of people, and it began to multiply. And that's why one of the visions we had is we wanted to reach all the university. There are eight 
grand committee sponsored universities here in Hong Kong. And right now we are on six of the eight and you'll see it here. So these are the universities that we have life groups in. Now there are two that we haven't reached out to yet, Lingnan and the Education University of Hong Kong. And so that's something that we want to pray for into the future. Because we believe that as a college student, universities, if you experience God and this gospel message that will transform your life, it will literally tr change the trajectory of where you will be five years from now. We also talked about reaching the city. We got to reach Hong Kong. Do you know how many districts there are in Hong Kong? Come on, everyone say it. Do you know? There are 18 districts in Hong Kong. And each district is different. You know what I'm talking about. Even though they're all local in many ways, but they're all different. With just unique struggles, unique challenges, unique issues in that district. And so we want to reach it. And one of the best ways to reach it is to start life groups in some of these districts. And that's why one of our vision was to literally see a life group almost near or on every single MTR station. And that's some of the things that we talked about where we can actually reach out to that community by starting life groups, those who work there, those families who are there. Because if we can reach Hong Kong this way by reaching universities and then also reaching the 18 districts, guess what? This is tied into what? Our vision of the circle. I'm not going to get it all into it because it's going to be too long. Some of you are like, oh my God, it's long already. But oh, give me a second here. Is that we're trying to reach the circle because there are close to... 53% of the world's population is within the circle. We share this all the time. This is our vision, to reach the circle. Majority of the world lives in this circle. And guess what's in the middle? It is not Taiwan, okay? It's Hong Kong. Some people know it's not, but we, we believe it's Hong Kong. <laughs> That's our Jerusalem. And we want to be able to spread to Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of this earth. We want to reach this circle with the billions of people who are in this circle. We cannot do this if we're not reaching Hong Kong. And we cannot do that, reaching Hong Kong, without reaching the 18 districts and reaching the universities. And the reason why we're sharing this is because we're going to make some changes. And some of you are going to hear this for the very first time. Uh, the leaders and those who are connected uh, with this particular situation, know about it, but many don't. So uh, as some of you know, Pastor Bo, he is in charge of the city ministry, which is the single adults and also the covenant ministry building blocks. But, you know, as we serve together, we oversee it. But we kind of gave him the leadership of overseeing the single adults. And he and I, and along with our wives, are helping out with the covenant ministry. So he's, he's going to come up here and just share with you very briefly about some of the changes that we're going to be making in this new life group cycle. Now, before you throw tomatoes and go crazy and like, what the, all that kind of stuff, have an open heart in light of what I shared. And if you have more questions, then you could talk to Pastor Bo, you can talk to any of the leaders, you could talk to me. And this is, this is me just being very upfront. We don't know how it's going to go. In fact, if I could be totally just forthright, we are scared out of our minds. We feel like we we're just putting a bomb under our church. It's, we're going to blow it up. And some people are like, what the? You know, okay, this is not good. Safety, we need safety. But, but listen, all I know is that sometimes God does things to get us out of our comfort zone, to do His will. And we're believing that that's what He's going to do. So, Pastor Paul, you want to come up? Let's give him a hand as he comes up and shares. Thank you. No bombs in this place, please. Um, how, how many single adults do we have here? All right, no tomato. No, I'm just kidding. We, we started, I, I want to share this, some of the changes, but we started our church in 2015, and our single adult ministry called Focus started in 2016 with just a handful of people, 15 to 20 uh, I see some of you in the, in the audience who were there, part of that initial group. You're troopers. You've been here, you know, rooted in Hong Kong for the last six or seven years. 
And, and one thing that we've seen over the last six years since we started at that point was a big just need for more just resources and community for the single adults. And uh, it's grown since then, since 2016. We started what, with 15, 20 people. Now uh, our focus ministry is up to 70 to 80 people. Can we praise God for that? That's just been incredible. And, and keep in mind, that's been through COVID, right? And that's where most things are on the decline, but still we saw growth. And we see the gospel, there's such a need. And as we were realizing that there's this trajectory, there's this growth, uh, even though we had two or three life groups in the past, we realized like if we were to have just two life groups this coming season, we would have life groups of 40 people each. I, those of you who were the women life group for the city ministry this past summer, you know what 40 person life groups were like. I mean, sure, it was fun and crazy a little bit, but it's a lot of people. And we realized at some point and as we we're praying, we need to get smaller. We need to find avenues to have smaller relational contexts to build more family intimate relationships we need to have contexts that are more uh, helpful for relational discipleship we need to create avenues so that more people have opportunities to take ownership so that it's not just a few serving but everyone together is really making up the family and then lastly, one thing that we're envisioning, and as Pastor Seth mentioned, is we want to see this vision of multiplying life groups all across the city. If we could reach all those 18 districts, like, praise God, that would be incredible. And some of you who live, like, closer to, like, Yunlong and Tumu, like, please, Lord, bring us there. Or Sai Kong, like, please, Lord, bring us there. Or on the island side, like, please, Lord, not just ICC, but somewhere else, you know, along the other side of the island. And so as we're praying through that, we said, okay, God, maybe you're calling us to take a step of faith. And so this year, what we want to do is instead of just having two life groups that are about 40 members each, we want to have, we're going to have five life groups uh, of groups of size around 15, maybe just at most 20 people. And we're envisioning having these groups meet all over the city, maybe in some people's homes that have slightly bigger living rooms that could fit that many people, or just in some of these smaller locations so that we can see multiplication, we can see ownership, we can see growth. And you're like, who's going to lead that? Well, the five of us that are on leadership right now as focus, we're going to be leading that. We want to invite all of us to partner together because it's not just, again, the one person who's serving and loving, but really as all community comes together, that's where we're able to serve and to bless one another. Uh, and then I also wanted to share uh, just a quick update for Covenant. Uh, many of you who are part of the Covenant Ministry families, shout out. Woo! Yeah, all right. Um, and we had a great summer. Uh, I, I know the men's group had a really good time together. The women's group, I think, meeting together after Sunday celebration was incredible. And we just heard a lot of just your input. And we know that in this life stage, especially with young children, like there's a lot of different factors involved. And so with that, we also wanted to share with you that for Covenant, what we're going to be doing is meeting uh, on Sundays right after Sunday celebration, having lunch together and meeting just alternating men's and women's. Uh, wives and husbands and families uh, on alternating weeks so that the men we can meet together, the women can meet together, and then the, our spouses can take the kids and watch them and really have that community there together because we value it and we know that time is such a limiting factor in this life stage. We also want to get together all together as families. So every six to seven weeks, we want to do something all together. Many of you were there at the hosting uh, of the dinner this past summer and had a great time. And we want to see more of that as we grow together as family. And so a lot of different changes, and we ask, please keep us in prayer, keep the leaders in prayer. And, and those of you who are students, like, yeah, this doesn't bother me. Pray for us, all right? Pray for the city ministry, and really pray that we're going to see incredible growth and multiplication this coming season. So praise God for that. Thank you, Pastor Bo, for sharing that. I'm just going to be, as your pastor, let me, let me speak to you. I'm going to try to be loving as possible. Those of you in the city ministry, those of us who are college students, I'm like, they're just still young. No, I'm not looking down on you. We love you, but you are still young. You haven't gone through a lot of things in life yet. You will. So you're par part of being a college ministry is to grow as a person. But I'm speaking to those of you in the city ministry. When you decrease the size of life groups and there's only one leader, you know what happens? You cannot hide. I remember when we first started our church, there were about nine of us in, in our apartment. If someone fell asleep when I was talking, you could tell. 
when the offering plate went around, you could tell. See, smaller the size, you can't hide anymore. Bigger the size, you can hide easily. Just do a little bit here. Just kind of do this and that. But you don't, you don't have to be all in. But when the group gets smaller and there's only one leader, then the burden becomes no longer on that leader, but now it becomes on the whole group. And I think this is one of the reasons why the city ministry did not grow. And it's not growing. Now, we're not talking about numbers. Yes, we're growing in numbers. But I'm talking about growing where we're raising up disciples and we're raising up people who love God and are saying, God, here's my life. I want to I serve you. I want to do everything. I want to fulfill my calling in my workplace. And you can hide when it's big, when it's 40. But when it's only about 13 or so, you can't. So you have to really be honest. If you don't want to be there, everyone will know you don't want to be there. You don't want to serve, everyone will know you don't want to serve. You could fake it and say, oh, I love Jesus, but you, you, know, you don't want to serve, you're not going to serve. You don't want to give, everyone will know. And what that does is it brings accountability to your life, which some of you might not want. Some of you might leave the church. But I'm going to tell you this. If we go in this direction and we trust in the Holy Spirit and you know who's the most scared? The leaders. They're like, oh my God. We're like, just relax. God is bigger than you. God is bigger than all of us. If we go in this direction, I am 100% confident that some of you are going to be not forced in an unwillingness way, but God is going to bring circumstances to bring you to a place where you're going to be have to make that decision. Am I going to live for myself and my selfish desires and goals or am I going to live for the purposes and the kingdom of God and these brothers and sisters who I claim to love? And I'm praying that God will do something powerful in the city ministry. We have 18 districts. And that's why what we're praying for is we're going to try to find all these places all throughout Hong Kong where we can meet in these smaller groups. And hopefully we can reach these 18 districts. That's on the city ministry. It's the work of God, but it's going to be through you. These college students, they'll reach out to their universities. But you city folks, you need to reach out to this city. And I do pray and I challenge you with a lot of love in my heart. I'm saying this pastorally to you, that you will not hide, but you will step up to the plate and say, you know what, to that leader, how can I help you? What are some things we can do together? And you're going to see a disciples being made you're going to see your faith some of your faith is going to grow like crazy that have hasn't grown for a while because you're trusting in jesus you're relying upon him and what he's going to do to those of us who are families married couples can i just challenge us when you think about all the societal problems it starts with the marriage and it starts with the family look at a lot of these students who are here in our midst some of them come from divorced homes some of them come from broken homes, dysfunctional homes. They have a father and a mother, but they're not present. So here we are, some of us who are working with college students have to deal with some of these guys, not in a negative way, but we trying to help you to understand the father's love that they did not get from their homes. Some of you who are parents, you're slowly realizing being a parent is not easy. It's hard. But you're supposed to reflect God's love. And sometimes if we're honest, we have conditional love. We get very angry. We get very impatient. And this is what the kids learn from us growing up. So we need to change as fathers, as mothers, as husbands and wives. So that we could be a good example to our family. Our, these little kids who are so impressionable. If you're expecting building blocks to transform, then you're sadly mistaken. It's only about an hour and a half or so per week. You have them for close to 16 some hours per day for the whole week. So the main influence has to come from you. So if your life is not being transformed, you're not growing in your relationship with Christ. I don't know what it is that you're leading your family with or towards. So I would just want to challenge us, once again, in a loving way, this year, let's do things differently. Let's not settle for the status quo. 
We've come out of, and we're still, still trying to come out of COVID. We wasted, in some ways, it feels like two years. But I feel like those two years was God doing things in our hearts. Because we could not do things as normal. Now as we're coming out of it, we cannot do business as usual. We have to do things differently. And I believe these are some of the things that God wants us to do differently. So let's believe by faith, trusting in Him, that as we look at scriptures and look at the early church, of course we cannot be exactly like them. Meeting every single day, are you kidding me? Some of us are like, no, I don't want that. They met together in their homes every day, even in the temple courts. It's kind of impossible in our generation. So we're not going to copy exactly, but what are the principles? And how do we then apply that into our lives? So I do pray that in the, this coming week, you'll be a part of a biblical community. Commit to it. Give your life to Jesus. And as an expression of your devotion to God, give of yourself to one another. And let's experience something very powerful for the glory of God. Can I get a good amen to that? Amen. Let's stand together as we close out in prayer. As I said, the first thing is to participate in a life group. And the second thing is to pray for our church. And that's what I want to do as we close out this morning. Can we just pray for our church? We're starting life groups this coming week. And I know some of, you, some of you are still thinking, oh my God, we're going to have five life groups, one leader. Okay, can, can you just for a moment stop thinking about yourself, just for one moment. And I want you to look towards God. Let's, let's look to Him, and He is the one who's going to carry us. He's the one who's going to help us to be the kind of community He wants us to be. And so as we're thinking about all these changes that are going to be happening, even covenant meeting on Sundays, starting next week with the men, and we're going to alternate, as we start thinking about these new life groups in our campuses and trying to see who's really going to join or not, like we cannot focus on ourselves. We need to focus on God. We need Him. So can I just encourage us? We're going to pray for a little bit. And I know some of you who are new, you're not used to maybe praying in a certain way, and that's okay because you pray the way you feel most comfortable with. Some of you might have never prayed, and that's okay. You could just kind of stand and just be in God's presence. But we cannot do anything without prayer. We need God. That's a prayer is a sign of dependence on God. So as a whole church, together, in one accord, in, in spirit, of one mind, one heart, as we always do whenever we have an opportunity, can we just join the aisles together? And I know some of us are sensitive with holding hands, so you don't have to hold hands, but at least lock elbows so you don't touch each other's hands. But if you feel comfortable enough, just give them that look. If they're stretching out their hands and they're comfortable, then you can reach out their hands. But if they're not, then... Just lock elbows together. Just for a couple minutes, together in one voice, as we pray in desperation before God. Let's pray for our church. Let's pray for our life groups this coming week. Let's say, God, meet us powerfully. Speak to us. Lord, serve people, serve people. Inspire people, inspire people. Love people, love people. And disciple people, disciple people. Found people, find people. And let's ask God to work in us so that we can reach all the campuses, all the 18 districts, and eventually start reaching the circle for the glory of God. Can we just do that? Come on, let's pray, church. Thank you for listening to the Harvest Mission Community Church Podcast. For more information, visit our website at hongkong.hmcc.net.